picture. <coughs> I think of my grandma Luann. Because <clears throat> she lived for baby lambs. Even at the expense of her grandchildren in the freezing January snow. If there was a baby lamb that needed help, it was going to get help. And I think that God designed the reaction to something cute like this to be that way. And I want to think about what this picture represents to each one of you. So maybe some of you don't have a lot of experience with young farm animals, but lambs are about as cute as farm animals get. They're funny, they are cuddly, they are soft, they are warm, and they're about as cute as you can get in the animal kingdom. And the topic that I've chosen today is Jesus, the Lamb of God. If you remember, the last couple times I've been up have been about Jesus and what roles he's fulfilled. Uh, Jesus, the anointed. And then we had a lesson, Jesus, the man, where we talked about how important it is in God's plan that Jesus was a man, that Jesus was just a man like we are what that meant to his entire plan. Building on that base of Jesus being a man, Jesus being our brother and being tempted and tested and tried like we are and being our example, I want to lead into this idea, this doctrine that Jesus is the Lamb of God and what that means. We're gonna start in Genesis chapter three and we're going to read verses 14 and 15. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the livestock and more than any animal of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will make enemies of you and the woman, and of your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now this doesn't mention anything about a sheep. This doesn't mention anything about a lamb directly. But this idea here, this prophecy about the descendant bruising the serpent's head and the serpent bruising this descendant's heel ties directly into God's plan for all mankind. This is the first prophecy in the Bible that's talking about Jesus, the offspring of the woman, and what his role is. His role is eventually to bruise the head of the serpent, to destroy the serpent. And this circles around to the serpent is going to do what he can to damage the descendant. But all he's going to succeed in doing is bruising him on the heel. In Genesis chapter 26, we read about Abraham's test, a test that God sent to Abraham and the correlation between this event that happened and what God did with his own son for our sake. Starting in verse 6, it says, And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. I always found it interesting that he took in his hand the fire. That seems a little painful, N not really on topic, but I, I don't think he walked with fire in his hand, but he had the materials to build the fire. Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Think about that one simple statement and the, the prophetic implications made there. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham knew what God had asked him to do. We call our gathering here, we have a sign out here that says, the Church of God, Faith of Abraham. Part of that is reflected in what Abraham chose to do 
when asked this frankly horrific thing of him. And yet Abraham had faith that God knew what he was doing. It was like he was God. So he answered his son and said, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So they walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. I can only imagine the terror that Isaac must have felt here and that Abraham must have felt here. As a child, it was I always put myself in Isaac's position and how scary it would be that uh, here we have an altar, we got fire, we got wood, and now dad's tying me up and laying me on top of the wood. Uh, what did I do wrong this time? And now as a father, I think, how this would have felt betraying your son. How, how this would have felt laying your own, your own child on top of this and knowing what God was asking you to do. And I can only imagine, because I'm not God, but how he must have felt when Jesus was on the cross asking him, why have you forsaken me? It was a pretty impactful thing. And God was putting Abraham through this practice. And Abraham reached out with his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not reach out your hand against the boy and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and beheld Behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. So God will provide himself a lamb. Abraham told Isaac this. I believe that this is a prophecy for all mankind, much like the offspring that will bruise the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise his heel. What we know is that God did not hold back. God did follow through with sacrificing his own son. Continuing on, it says, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and he said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." So because Abraham had faith in God, and because he followed through with God's command up to the point when he was stopped just before the dagger thrust, God gave him these blessings. And in so doing, those blessings have carried on through the ages, through the children of Israel, through the Jewish nation, through Christ, and into the Gentiles through baptism. Because of Abraham's faith and Abraham's sacrifice, we all have a chance of salvation. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the sacrificial process that the nation of Israel was under. And I say a little bit because there were a lot. There was several different reasons that they had to sacrifice, several, several different types of animals that they had to sacrifice from bulls, goats, sheep, doves, for multiple reasons, for guilt offerings, if you felt guilty about the sin that you committed, for sin offerings, if you committed a sin, for burnt offerings. They had offerings to sanctify the priests that were required for seven days. This is just a small piece of what the sacrifices were required of. In Exodus chapter 29, verses 38 through 46. 
Now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two one-year-old lambs each day, continuously. So baseline, if nobody in the nation sinned and needed to offer a sin offering, not likely, but if nobody did, two animals every day sacrificed as a burnt offering. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And there shall be a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and a fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering with one lamb. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer with it the same grain offering and the same drink offering as in the morning for a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. It shall be continual, it shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. So remember the image that I put up there of the baby lamb. That's a little bit younger than a yearling, but the idea is these animals didn't do anything to divide to to deserve this sacrifice, much like and in correlation to. Jesus didn't do anything to deserve the sacrifice that he was put through. And yet two animals per day had to be sacrificed. And the reason why it had to be sacrificed given here for the burnt offering is so that the Lord will meet with them there and speak with them. Now imagine the multiple other sacrifices that are prescribed in Exodus, and we're going to read a couple more in Leviticus. Imagine if you were with Jesus when he walks into the marketplace, and the whole plan of this was you're supposed to take an animal that means something to you, that's of value to you, so that when you give it to the priest to sacrifice for your sin offering or for your guilt offering, you're supposed to feel something. What good is a guilt offering if you are guilty of something? You go to the market and you buy two doves that you have no idea their upbringing, they meant nothing to you. You buy these two doves to the vendor and then take them and have them sacrificed. Shouldn't that make you feel doubly guilty? And that's what Jesus was thinking about when he walked in that marketplace and saw these people offering animals for a profit. They were marketizing the entire process that God set up for a feeling to be introduced into a person. Continuing on in Exodus, I will meet there with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory. And I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. And I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve as priests to me. And I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the purpose here for the burnt offering in specific was so that they would remember twice a day, forever, that he was their God, that he led them out of Egypt, and that he was, would meet with them and talk with them. In Leviticus chapter 4, we have some more information about the sin offering. So what we just read about was the burnt offering. And now we have a little bit of detail about the sin offering. If someone brings a lamb as their sin offering, they are to bring a female without defect. They are to lay their hand on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. So they bring it to the same place where the burnt offering is going. And it's slaughtered there. I don't know how many of you have had to slaughter an animal. I've slaughtered a few. I'm a hunter. It's not a good feeling. It's not something that most people look forward to. For those that haven't, 
it may be a terrible feeling. And that's exactly the point. The point is, it should feel like I'm taking a life of this animal because of my sins. And we should be able to take that feeling, whether we've done it or not, and apply it to every time we sin. We're doing this to Christ again. We're telling Christ that his death was not good, of, good enough for us. They're to lay their hand on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. They shall remove all the fat, just as the fat is removed from the lamb of the fellowship offering. And the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the flood or on top of the food offerings presented to the Lord. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them, for the sin they have committed, and they will be forgiven. So this sacrifice was supposed to create a feeling in each individual. And the result of this feeling, the result of this repentance, I'm going to call it, resulted in God forgiving the individual's sin. In Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to start reading about some prophecies here and about the role that this Lamb of God plays in his plan. The Lamb that was prophesied in Genesis with Abraham. The offspring that is prophesied in Genesis 3 as the offspring of the woman. In Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to read the whole chapter. It's not very long. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty, majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So think about that. The iniquity of us all. Now Isaiah is talking about his nation at this time. But we know from the writings of Paul in the New Testament that this includes all of the sin beyond the point of Jesus' sacrifice are also laid on him. There is only the one sacrifice made. But Isaiah is writing this to his countrymen, to his national people. He's saying that Jehovah has laid on this man the iniquity of all of us. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, also known as a sin offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So, when 
the people of Israel were instructed to take these animals. They were instructed to take animals that meant something to them. They were supposed to be the best that they could from their own flock. They were supposed to be, a, in, in the case of the sin offering, it was supposed to be a, a spotless female lamb. There were some provisions if the family did not have enough money or did not have a large enough uh, family to have sheep that they could instead use doves. But those doves were supposed to be animals that they brought up that meant something to them. Once again, the marketizing that was done, the capitalistic movement that was done in that marketplace that Jesus went into and up, upended, how much of an insult would that be to him and his God, knowing what his, he knew what his role was. He knew what his sacrifice was going to be and what it was for. And he saw what the law had degraded to. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read some words here that Paul writes after the fact, after Jesus has died, after he was sacrificed for the sins of all. And he says in verse 1, he says, The law is only a shadow of the good things to come, and not those things themselves. So the law, the sacrifice of the animals, was a shadow of what was to come. It was a shadow of the true lamb, the sacrificial lamb of God. It wasn't the real thing. It was supposed to symbolize to, it was supposed to, symbolize to those people what had to be done in order to have forgiveness, in order to cover sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And without death, there can be no forgiveness. So this shadow of things to come was supposed to teach people something until the, the full sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Paul continues and says, For this reason the law can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually every year, Make those who approach perfect. So even if this process had been done perfectly, even if it hadn't degraded to purchasing the animals that you were going to sacrifice, even if it hadn't degraded to people not really thinking about their sins, just going through the motions. Now, does that sound like maybe something that might affect us, just going through the motions? I know that sometimes I, when I sin and I know it, for a period afterwards, I'm too embarrassed to ask for, for forgiveness. I know that I have to get over myself, and I have to move forward, and I have to ask for that forgiveness. But I know that there's feelings in me going, I don't think I'm worthy to. I don't think I'm worthy to even ask God to forgive me because I've done this sin now five times, and I'm supposed to be getting better. And what God tells us is, every day these people had to go through these motions. We have to do the same thing. And I know that a lot of the time we'll stand up here and we'll talk about how the nation of Israel lost their vision and lost their hearing and lost their, their fervor for doing what was right. But I think it's critically important to realize that we are of the exact same race. We are of the exact same caste. We're Adam's offspring, and we can fall into that same trap. So we have to make it a practice to feel the way that God wants us to feel, and to go through the motions, and to go through that experience when we ask for forgiveness, and to be sincere. And Paul says here, same sacrifices which they offer continually every year make those who approach perfect. Can't happen. We've already sinned. We can't be made perfect. But that does not mean God just says, okay, then stop trying. God still expects forward motion. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all 
and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Does it sound right? Same thing that Abraham said. God will provide a lamb. God will provide the sacrifice. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. So does that mean that although God did not like the sacrifice of animals, of bulls and of sheep, that he delights in the sacrifice of his own son? Is that what that means? No, that's not what that means. What that means is that the blood of the animals was never going to be sufficient. It was never the plan of God that that law was going to be the salvation of man. It was the plan of God that the sacrifice of his son would be the salvation of man. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. And yet, that's what God asked them to do. So, these priests knowing that what they're doing is not actually taking away sins, they still had a role to fulfill. They had a role to fulfill for themselves, to try to consecrate themselves, to try to keep that communication pathway between God and the priests, and therefore to the nation of Israel open. And we know that they were only partially successful with that. There were times where God did not talk to the people of Israel because either the people were too evil or the priests were too evil or both. It was usually both at the same time. And yet these priests were still asked to do it. And he continues on, he says, but when this priest, speaking of Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. We no longer have the sacrifices. We no longer are under the old law. We no longer have to go and sacrifice a sheep every morning and every night and any time we're guilty of a sin or any time we didn't realize we committed a sin, but find out later we did. And praise God, we don't have to do that anymore. Praise God that he gave his only son as a sacrifice for our sins. And we, like the priests, we have to be diligent to understand every day of our lives what that means to us and what we should feel because of that. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. So Jesus sits at the right hand of God after he had completed his role, after he had lived a perfect life after he had fulfilled his role as the Lamb of God. And now he sits and waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So I focused on our responsibility to make our heart contrite, to make our walk as holy as we can. On the other side of this, Try to imagine what Christ feels. He sacrificed his life. How much of mankind does he want to save? How many of us does he want to 
confessed to his father, these are my people. His sacrifice is of huge value to us, but it's also of huge value to him. He wants brothers and sisters, and God wants children. So this last phrase here, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Does that mean that once you're saved, you're going to be always saved? Well, the context was that the priest had to continually do the sacrifices every day. They had to still go through the motions. We still have to do what Christ did and what God wants us to do every day. We still have to go through the motions, and we have to make those motions emotions. We have to make sure that that's driving us. Because if it's just on the surface, God can see right through that. And we're going to close here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. For you have been called for this purpose, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being abusively insulted, he did not insult in return. While suffering, he did not threaten, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself brought our sins in his body up on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Let's go ahead and close with a song.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving your Son as a sacrifice for all of the sins of mankind. We ask that you forgive us when we do fall short of the expectations set for us. We ask that you help us to remember these things that you've taught us and to help us incorporate them into our very being. Most of all, we ask that you save us all a place in that kingdom that's promised when you send your son back to this earth to establish that kingdom in your, in your name. Please, God, if this be your will, and in Jesus' name, amen. amen.